Good morning, Fellowship. Beautiful to see your wonderful faces, whether you're here and here for the first time, whether you're online, uh, wherever you're watching us, uh, whether you're in the overflow or in the family room. It's such a joy to be together in one fashion or another around God's Word. I don't know about you, but I want to, I've been burdened to pray for peace in the Middle East. Will you join me in that? Oh, Heavenly Father, as we think of the conflict between Israeli and Palestinians right now, we come to you, Father of all comfort. We come to you, Jesus, Prince of Peace. We come to you, Holy Spirit of Love. And we pray today for the deep conflict that lies between these groups. So many lives lost in this conflict. So many families destroyed. Our heart goes out to all who have suffered. And our prayers go out to you, Lord. We beg for peace. We ask for justice. We plead for wisdom, especially for those whose decisions affect children. And we ask, Heavenly Father, more than anything, for reconciliation. Please, Lord, bring this conflict to an end. Please, Lord, may you bring peace in the Middle East. In the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Keep praying that prayer, my friends. From the moment pretty much we were born, we learnt that there was us and there's them. Us, whoever the us is, and them. Uh, Our people and those people. And we started probably with our parents learning about our people, our whatever the us is, our family, our clan, our tribe, our nation, and them. And we were right, they were wrong. God was on our side, not their side. We could only do good, they could only do bad. The lines were drawn, and don't ever think about marrying and falling in love with someone who belonged to them. (laughs) Now, after 2,000 years of Christianity, understand that we take for granted the wonder that in Christ, no one is off limits, and everyone has access, full access to the grace of our God. It's so easy to take it for granted. The whole book of Acts is is trying to thump that idea. For example, the vision of Acts, I've summarised it this way. The vision is the vision of the risen Jesus empowered by his spirit to proclaim his apostolic word to who? The nations, all of them. What Jesus started on earth, he's going to finish in heaven in taking this unstoppable word of grace to the ends of the earth and breaking every no-go zone that there is. Because in Christ, no one is off limits and everyone has full access. And that includes the worst of sinners, whom we now know as Paul, but was once called Saul, who was damaging the church. Let's pick it up in chapter 8, verse 3. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them into prison. Saul, the attacks of Saul were so vicious, so violent. He would drag mums and dads out of their homes with kids screaming and crying and placing them into jail because they were followers of Jesus. It it caused people to leave their homes in Jerusalem and Judea and be scattered. Now, persecution was being strangely used by God to carry the message to the ends of the earth. Uh, Tertullian mentions this even in the third century, a couple of centuries after this, when he writes of persecution in the church, he says this, as often as you mow us down, the more we grow in number. The blood of Christians is the seed of the church. And the man called Saul, who was the first to kill Christians, Stephen, is the man who became Paul, a follower of Jesus and his apostle, who now would be killed for Christ. And the point being here is you can't decide ahead of time whether you think someone is too evil to be a follower of Jesus and be saved. That's not up to you and that's not up to me. You take an extreme example like Jeffrey Dahmer. He was a a well-known serial killer from the United States. He strangled and dismembered 17 boys and men. He was a serious piece of work. He even cannibalized some of them. In 1994, while in prison, he genuinely put his faith in Christ and repented. 
He actually wanted to be baptised. Uh, the pastor who baptised him, uh, Ratcliffe, said that Jeffrey, he dreaded that I might say, no, you're too evil, you're too sinful, I can't baptise someone like you. And you can understand, he was a serious piece of nasty work. But what he needed to understand was, in Christ, no one is off limits. Everyone has full access to the grace of our God. And that includes Samaritans. Samaritans, those who hated the Jews and were hated by the Jews. Verse 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he had performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with, for with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. We're now at the next stage of God's plan. Do you remember when Jesus said in Acts 1.8 that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem? Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. He's not just making a description of geography. He's actually saying that God is breaking into no-go zones. Jerusalem, done. Judea, done. Now in Samaria. That, that group of people who were off limits to the Jews. You know, there was a lot of bad blood between Samaritans and Jews. I mean, when Jesus talked about the story of the good Samaritan, it really upset the Jews because as far as they were concerned, the only good Samaritan was the dead Samaritan. Uh, they happened to be, remember there were 12 tribes, the, ton, the, top, 10, 12, sorry, the top 10 tribes of Israel uh, had rebelled against God, had worshipped other gods, God had raised the Assyrians to take them out and then they intermarried and then they started worshipping other gods, set up different temples, rejected most of the Old Testament and uh, there was uh, bloodshed between the two groups. In fact, by the time Jesus came, if you really, really wanted to criticise Jesus, the worst thing you could say of him was this in John 8, 48. This is what they said. You are a Samaritan and demon-possessed. So in other words, if you're a Samaritan, you might as well demon, be demon-possessed. Not even though the Samaritans would be off limits to the grace of God. You know, that conflict between Samaritans and Jews is really one of so many conflicts that are everywhere in the world. No one's escaping it. At no time in the world has the world been exempted. At the moment, I know there's a Palestinian-Israeli issue. There's the Tutsis and the Hutu back in Rwanda in the past, Ukraine and Russia, Turks and Greeks, Armenians and Azerbaijanians, and the list goes on and on and on. What I love is God didn't want to keep Samaria, though, in the dark. He had a future for this people. He had a future for all those people groups. Ezekiel 16, we read this. I will restore the fortunes of Samaria and her daughters. You see, the Samaritans had given up on the true God, but the true God had not given up on the Samaritans. And you can say that for your people and those people who are your enemies. No person, no clan, no tribe, no nation is off limits to the grace of God. If you have been wounded by a people group, you'll be tempted to think that's not them, but it is. If you have been taught to hate a particular tribe, family, clan, God wants you to know that he wants them to know his son that they may be forgiven. So pray for them. Uh, we had a a small group where a Turk and a Greek co-ran the group. They were joint Bible study leaders. And uh, young Christian men they were, and uh, from cultures that, you know, were not friendly to each other. And they used to say, now that we're followers of Jesus, the only thing we argue about is who came up with the kebab first. <laughs> and I love that because in Christ, no one is off limits. Everyone has full access even those who practice sorcery and witchcraft. You know how spiritually bankrupt the Samaritans were that they not only tolerated, but they followed Simon the sorcerer. Verse 9. 
Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practised sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. Simon claimed to be great. He acted like he was great, and the believers and the uh, Samaritans uh, believed he was great. Um, he was persuasive in his demonstration of occult practices. Uh, all levels of society followed him. Now, as a rule, anyone who comes to you and starts talking about how great they are, be suspicious. That's usually code for stay away from them. He practiced the dark arts from sorcery to spells. Now, I know some of you have flirted in that world. Perhaps you're still doing it. Uh, occult practices, clairvoyancy, numerology, palm reading, fortune telling, Ouija boards. Um, uh, the list goes on. There's so many. It's astrology, reading your stars. And you understand what lies well behind it. It's your desire to somehow take control of your future. It's your attempt to want to basically manage relationships in your life. You want to know the future ahead of time so you can be in control of your future and to do it in a way that draws on spiritual things without, interestingly, having to repent. <laughs> because the occult never wants you to repent. But repent we must. And I say to you today, if you've been in that world and you're presently in that world, you do need to repent of those. It is deemed in the Bible as an abomination to God. But repent with the assurance that forgiveness is yours. Why? <laughs> I'll tell you why. Because in Christ, no one is off limits. Everyone's got full access to the mercy of God. So God sends Philip to Samaria to preach the good news with signs and wonders. In verse 12, this is what happened. When they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Because Philip wasn't offering them the words of men, but the words of God. He wasn't simply enacting the, the works of men. It was the works of God with signs and wonders given to him by God through the Holy Spirit. It was demonstrating the power of the kingdom and confirming that the message of Jesus was right and that he indeed was alive and he was Lord the Samaritans went from Simon says to Jesus says. There's repentance for you. Simon himself repents. Simon the sorcerer repents. The man who was in the heart of the, the kingdom of darkness is now baptized. Simon, who amazed others, now is himself amazed at the power and the glory of God and Jesus Christ. Verse 13. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. Simon, who was a self-appointed great one, now bows before the greatest one of all, Lord Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. In Christ, no one is off limits. Everyone has full access to the grace of God, even those who practice the dark arts, and they are dark and part of the kingdom of darkness. I knew a lovely lady. Uh, she'd become a Christian. She used to be in witchcraft. And, uh, and I said to her, what's the difference between the two worlds, the two spiritual worlds of light and darkness? She said, well, when I was into witchcraft, I would uh, do my chants and cantations and so forth. And when I did it, I did have a sense of peace within me. But the moment I stopped, the peace left. It never stayed with me. But when I came to the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus, I gained the peace of God which permanently stayed with me. It is so much better living with Jesus who is for me. No one is off limits, even those who flirt with the dark arts. Now, did you notice though a problem in the reading? Something strange happens. Look at verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, that's the gospel of grace, they sent Peter and John, the apostles, to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the, for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Can you see the problem there? 
So here you've got believers who have put their faith in Jesus but have not yet received the Holy Spirit, that there's a delay between those two experiences. You see it here, you see it in Acts chapter 10, and you see it in Acts 19. So the question is, why here, why now? Because this seems to break the normal rule. It's an exception that is proving the rule. Remember, Acts Let's take a step back. Acts is a book of first things, first time. The first time that the Spirit comes upon all who call on the name of the Lord. The first time that the good news of Jesus goes to the Samaritans. And so the question now is, could the Samaritans, the arch enemy of God's people, actually become believers in the Messiah whom they rejected? Would they be equal with the same Jewish believers who received the Spirit at Pentecost? I like how Barak, our pastor at Creekside, said, he said, are Samaritans now going to be citizens or, sorry, residents or citizens in the church of God? Are they actually going to be equal? For this reason, I think God had withheld giving these believers the Spirit so that the apostles could lay hands on them, and as they received the Spirit, they could verify to all the other Jews that what God had done at Pentecost with the Jews at Pentecost, he has now done with the Samaritans in Samaria. They're in. They're one of us. There's no us and them anymore. It's just us. Because no one is, is off limits. And you can see that because the apostles go back to Jerusalem preaching in every Samaritan town. They're now on God's agenda. Or sorry, they were always on God's agenda. They're now on the apostles' agenda. Now, this passage, I think, has been misread by some. Second blessing theology, and I understand where it comes from because if you use this passage as your controlling passage, you will end up with a second blessing. Do you know what I mean by that? Second blessing theology says... You, there are those who believe in Jesus, and there are those who believe in Jesus and are baptized in the Holy Spirit. So you've got kind of two classes of Christians. And so they use this passage to argue the point, and I can see why. But what they fail to understand is this. It's that, um, uh, that what you've got here is a unique moment because God is wanting to make sure that these apostles can verify that the Samaritans are in. The problem with... Second blessing theology, it has two levels of Christians. And this passage is doing the very opposite to that. It's saying there's not two levels, there's just one. You believe and receive the Holy Spirit. Here it was delayed, but very unusually delayed. I can't stress how important it is, friends, that Jesus here is wanting to say that everyone, whether you're Jew or Samaritan, Fly first class in the kingdom of God. Every believer in, who has faith in Christ, remember what Peter said? If you repent and believe, you will receive the gift of forgiveness and the gift of the Spirit. In fact, Paul will say in Romans that if you do not have the Spirit, you do not have Jesus. If you have Jesus, you've got the Spirit. Be assured of that. No one is off limits. Everyone has full access to God. Now, even Simon the sorcerer, but there's something, something strange about his faith. Look at verse 18. When Simon saw that the spirit was uh, given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered the money and said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. You can see now what he's doing. Those past inclinations are still with him. He's hungry for power. And he wants access to the power, and he's prepared to pay for it. He's putting his money where his mouth is. Verse 20, he gets one stiff rebuke from Peter. Peter answered, oh, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart, for I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Wow, that is one stiff rebuke. Now, it's interesting. He doesn't say, well, you've got an evil demon in there. You've got to cast that out. No, no. This is sin, and you need to repent, and you need to pray to Jesus and ask for mercy. And even Simon the sorcerer, even at this point, 
as he asks to buy the gift of God and falls into yet another sin, even he is given access to the mercy of God. I think of a dear lady, a young believer. She came to me, she said, she said, oh, Ray, she said, my sister had died and I was so upset and grieving, I went straight to a clairvoyant that I used to see before I became a believer. And I just need, I said, why did you do that? She said, I just wanted to know where she was. And she said, I know I've done the wrong thing. Will Jesus forgive me? And the answer is, of course he'll forgive you. He always forgives anyone who repents and puts their faith in him. In Christ, no one is off limits. But I do want to say, friends, beware of those who want to buy blessings from God. (laughs) Beware of those who tell you you can buy blessings from God. (laughs) Beware of those who give money with the desire to want to influence. Beware of those who use church relationships to make money. You know, you give your details to someone and before you know it, you're on the company's database getting great deals. Well, that's okay if you, if you know about it. It's not okay if you weren't told about it. Now, Peter has given a stiff rebuke, but remember, he knows how to receive a stiff rebuke. Do you remember when in Mark 8, Jesus, he says to Jesus that he, he wants a Christ without a cross? And Jesus says to him this in Mark 8. Jesus says to Peter, but when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. I wonder how you receive a rebuke, how you receive a correction. Some people get a slight correction and they kind of get so upset, they leave the church and they say the judgmental. But I tell you this, how you receive a rebuke and a correction will determine how well you go in the Christian life. The thing about the church is we're a laboratory of holiness for God. And, uh, and sure, some people give wrong rebukes and you have to test them. Sometimes they give right re- rebukes in the wrong way without love, sure. But at the end of the day, we not only encourage one another, correcting one another is actually part of the story of how we become more like Jesus. Peter had to receive that rebuke from Jesus. Simon had to re- re- receive that rebuke from Peter. He had to understand, you can't buy the blessings from God. Give, yeah, your tithes and offering. Give because everything belongs to God. Give because God has given you his one and only son. Give because, wow, you're so thankful for his forgiveness and adoption. Give for God's glory. Give because you want to help those who are lost that they may be saved. Give because you want to support workers in the harvest. But do not give if you think it's going to make God owing you. Don't give if you think God owes you. That's just manipulating God. Don't go down that road, friends. No one is off limits. Everyone in Christ has full access. The worst of sinners, Saul, knew that. The Samaritans and Simon knew that. But now we're interested, introduced to a God-fearing African man, an Ethiopian. And, and I love this brother. Uh, an angel of the Lord sends Philip now to a chariot where there's an Ethiopian who's reading from the scriptures, Isaiah 53. And the spirit brings him to walk alongside and, and can I just say, reminding us that Christianity is not a white man religion. From the very beginning, Africans were part of the Jesus story. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Any Africans in the house? I I said I like it. (laughs) I love that. In fact, they're at Pentecost, they're here, they're in Acts 13, the first church that sent out uh, uh, the uh, first missionaries had leaders who were from uh, North Africa. That's good. Acts 8 verse 30. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man, that's the Ethiopian man, uh, reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Wow, that would have been a great Bible study in that chariot as they're going. Do you understand what you're reading? Isn't that beautiful? I love that question because God wants you to understand his word. He doesn't speak for his words to fall to the ground. He's sure he raises up people with gifts of teaching. Hopefully that's kind of happening now. That's why we gather on Sunday in part, not all exclusively, so we may understand his word. That's why we have small group ministry. 
Uh, you know, we want to develop, do life together in community. But one of the things is we actually want to help each other understand what we are reading in Scripture. And often the time, the small groups are following the Sunday sermon preaching so we can learn together. In fact, the children are learning what the adults are learning at the same time. So Philip asks, starts with the very passage that the Ethiopian man was reading. And guess what he was reading? It was a cracker of a passage. It's Isaiah 53. Now, you may know what that means, but I'm telling you, it is one of the great job descriptions of Jesus. He quotes these words in verse 32. He was led like a... This is what he's reading in the chariot, right, when Philip comes on. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And he says to Philip... Is, he, is Isaiah talking about himself or somebody else? Hmm, I wonder who he's talking about, like a lamb to the slaughter, silent. I wonder who that could be. Anyone got any ideas? Jesus. <laughs> this passage predicts Jesus going to the cross in humble humility, the silent lamb of God who would be slayed for our sins so that we may be forgiven. So different from the power uh, the power grabbing game that Simon the sorcerer wanted to play. Jesus, who gave up his power at the cross so that he could give you the power of salvation. I love this, brother. And look what he says. After he finds out that the whole of the Old Testament is like a one way street that leads to Jesus, he then says, Look, here is some water. His first response is, What can stand in the way? Of my, me being baptised. Now remember, he wasn't just a beautiful African, God-fearing man. He was a eunuch. You understand eunuchs? They were castrated. He would travel. He had travelled from, remember, he'd just come from Jerusalem worshipping the Lord. He had gone from Ethiopia all the way to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast there and praise the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a 1,500-mile trip. That's 2,500 kilometers in that chariot and back again to actually get to the temple and to discover each year from Deuteronomy 23 that those castrated were not admitted into the assembly of the Lord. Oh. All that effort, but he would do it. He would do it. Probably he did it every year. Because in old covenant religion, he was off limits because he was castrated. He was denied full access into the presence of God's temple. And now he is saying, is there anything stopping me from now being baptized? Is there anything stopping me from being united with Christ and the body of Christ? so that I could have now full access in a way that I didn't have when I was a, a, simply a follower of God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now that I know that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, do you think I could have access? Now imagine what baptism meant to him. Imagine what baptism meant to, to Saul, the worst of sinners. Imagine what bap- baptism meant to the Samaritans and Simon the sorcerer. To actually... What, what it meant to this Ethiopian eunuch who had been shut out, as it were, from the presence of God and then to be baptised in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, to be united with Christ and his people, to come out of the baptism waters as a new creation filled with joy. Wow, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. I'm part of the people of God to know that in Christ, no one is off limits and everyone has full access to the grace of God, including me. I can't tell you that would have been a momentous moment for that dear African brother. I wonder, what's stopping you from coming to Christ? What's stopping you from being baptised? Can I say, what's stopping you from praying for your enemy, that they may be saved? What is stopping you from telling your Jesus story to your enemies, to them, and not just us? I wonder, friends, who have you decided is off limits to Jesus? 
because you and I need to repent of that, however we were brought up. This Ethiopian man probably was the first African to be baptised, but you know he's not the last. Here's a lovely photo of Sam, one of our youth leaders, getting baptised. And today, this morning, we heard of a Malawi sister getting baptised because the power of the gospel of grace is simply unstoppable. In Christ, there are no limits and everyone has full access. What a great God we worship. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, we want to say thank you for for this wonderful, unstoppable message of grace that keeps breaking down every human no-go zone. There simply is no limits. You accept anyone with any background from any nation, language, and tribe. And you give every one of those who genuinely believe and repent of their sins complete and full access, whether they were the worst of sinners like Saul, whether they were in the dark arts like Simon, or whether they were shut out because of physical defect like the castrated Ethiopian, who in old covenant religion was shut out. Whatever our story, whatever our experience, whatever we have become, thank you, Lord, for the absolute certainty that in Christ there are no limits and everyone has full access. And, Lord, we pray today, just as we had an African brother come to Christ for the first time at the 9 o'clock service, so we pray, Lord, that today that there'll be those from different nations and languages here gathered, whether in this room, in the overflow or online, who will say yes to you once and for all in Jesus' name. And all the saints said? Amen Amen indeed. Let's praise our God.